through super quick because that one's easier. Language. All right. Um, language was a very misunderstood topic until uh, the mid 20th century when um, uh, Noam Chomsky and uh, others, like later Stephen Pinker and, and, what, and other people who I can't recall specifically, but those two are the big ones, especially Chomsky. They actually made the discovery, along with, of course, the brain guys like Broca and Wernicke that found the areas of your brain where it's focused. Um, they, uh, they discovered sort of how brains operate. I don't mean mechanically, that's more of a Broca, Wernicke thing, uh, but they uh, theoretically discovered sort of how brains operate. So this is kind of what Noam uh, Chomsky's assertion is. So Noam Chomsky, um, sometimes it's referred to as the Chomsky revolution in language. Language isn't learned, according to Chomsky. Like yes, you do have to learn individual letters and things for your language, but your ability to learn language is uh, intrinsic. You already have the circuits for it. Your brain's already looking for language, how to interpret it, and then how to also replicate it to communicate. It, it's happening constantly. That's why you can take any one infant and put them anywhere in the world, regardless of their race, and they will learn the language that is around them because they will naturally absorb it and they will naturally uh, grow it. And that's the term he uses, by the way. He's not that we learn language because we're actually predisposed for it. Uh, my son's just like, you know, as, as early as six months, he was already uh, listening to what? Oh, he's listening earlier than that. But as early as six months, he's already saying, trying to say or saying words that, I think he said mama at six and a half months or something like that. And now he's really working on saying green uh, uh, well, because that's apparently his favorite color, because uh, he just loves, picks up green things and says green. So I guess his favorite color is green um, uh, and blue. And he's also trying to say cat, so things like that. Um, and he's just, he just turned nine months old. And, uh, uh, but like, we're not like teaching him that. He's just hearing it and then automatically taking it in, realizing that that is attached to something abstractly and then recognizing that's how you communicate that thing uh, to other people. Uh, so we have this circuitry that's when we're born, so long as our Broca and Wernicke areas are intact and functioning normally, which again, we found out exists because if you uh, damage them, there's a lesion you can't either comprehend or express language. So long as those are intact and operating normally in your left hemisphere, you are automatically from birth uh, taking in information, trying to interpret it, uh, and use it yourself. So uh, according to him, again, if we have the circuitry, it's intrinsic. Circuitry, circuitry, not what I'm asking. Uh, and we actually grow language rather than learn it. There is something about language we do learn something that is not intrinsic at all. This is actually a cultural innovation that really helped humanity out, don't get me wrong, but it's very unnatural, and it didn't even exist uh, for throughout 99.9% .9 of human history. Anybody know what that is? It's writing. Oh. Writing is new for humans. Like, it's, what was the first one? Uh, the Sumerian, uh, yeah, cuneiform and, and hieroglyphics. I can't remember exactly what years it is because I haven't taught that in like two or three years. But yeah, it's like not even, it's basically around 4,000 years old. I don't remember the exact year, but uh, it's only a few thousand years old and humans have been around for over 200,000 years. So for most of our existence, at least, uh, writing has not existed. That was a very specific cultural innovation made in the uh, Mesopotamia region, just because there were so many cultures there sharing ideas and whatnot, uh, and, and, and developing complex economies that they had to start tracking things, and that's how they start, started inventing language. And we have written laws eventually, like Kramurabi and Ernamu. Uh, we're getting really AP world on you. But nonetheless, uh, that's really new, and that's why it's hard, too. It takes you years to learn it. You learn how to speak by like age three. By age three, you know enough assuming that you're following the normal uh, progress, uh, developmental progress. And again, there are some people that don't. Uh, but assuming you're following that, by the time you're a toddler, you can already say enough words to communicate with human beings to live your life. Uh, obviously, you can't express everything, all of the nuanced things, and that's why you add to your language as you grow. But I mean, if I talk to a three or four or five year old, they can pretty much tell me anything they're feeling or anything they need, anything they want for the most part, uh, and, and it's enough. Uh, but we, we add to that to be more specific about exactly what they mean and, 
and add abstraction and, and nuance to, uh, to what we're saying. But the writing thing takes way longer, the process itself. Uh, to learn how to write well, uh, 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 to be able to read it well, uh, we, we speak and uh, listen way faster than we can uh, write or read by a large margin because it requires a lot more unnatural computation and, uh, and uh, interpretation. Uh, we do it. That's why I can just speak to you, blah, blah, blah. All these words are coming out, and you can hear them and respond. And there's not a whole lot of conscious thought because it's a very intrinsic part of our circuitry. Reading uh, and writing, however, take a fair degree of, of actual effort uh, to do. Uh, and that's why they're generally slower, and it's harder to learn them. And unless you're taught it, you don't learn. It's not automatic. Like, I will automatically learn how to speak and listen. I will not automatically learn how to read and write. You have to teach me how to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can absorb an unlimited amount of um, languages. Uh, so if I grow up bilingual or trilingual or whatever lingual, um, some people learn languages more or faster than others. But yeah, there's there's no real uh, trick to that. That doesn't make it more difficult. Um, it gives you an advantage, I guess, because you can now speak to or understand a, a wider range of people. But like you know, having it or not having it, it's not going to really affect your life to any major, you know, negatively or, or positively. I mean, it's more positive than negative because you can now understand more things, but you don't need it, per se. Is that the reason why you can go to, like, let's say, another country that speaks a different language than you, um, we could say, uh, France, and you're easier, it's more easier to learn French in France than it is over here? It, it is anywhere where they're using the language. Yeah. So if you learn, and this is true of it, any, any linguist will tell you this, uh, you learn a language much quicker when you're immersed in it, like when you're kind of like forced to. It's always around you, because again, your brain's always taking information, it's always looking to communicate. Uh, so yeah, if I take a class on a language, I'll learn some words and things, but I'm not gonna learn it nearly as well as if I just go and immerse myself in it. Like, will I suck for a year? Yeah, uh, but uh, that one year of you going to that country, or, or even if it's, like, it's your family, just speaking with them in that language, like that'll, That'll develop much quicker than you could in a in a in a classroom where it's you know reading and writing focused. And there are some speaking and, and and listening that you have to do obviously, but yeah, you learn much quicker. Just go do it because your brain automatically soaks this stuff in. It should be noted though that it's harder the older you get to do that because you get more stuck in um, the languages that you know. It's not that you can't. Like I learned German uh, really quickly um, uh, in college, right? But uh, if I'm a toddler, I'm gonna learn it way way easier. So like I'm intentionally teaching my kids that as they grow up uh, a little bit. By the way, I don't speak fluently, but um, I know enough to communicate like a toddler in German. <clears throat> I was gonna ask, like, is it true that it's harder to learn a language when you're older? Yes, it is. Oh. Uh, that one's that's well documented, and they don't know it's just because uh, your uh, neural circuitry just becomes more consolidated after all that myelination, or if certain uh, neurons are just not active because you're not learning the language, but you are, but not different ways. Nonetheless, it does get old harder as you're, as you're older, uh, but it's not impossible. You could learn a language at 50. It's just gonna take more effort and probably more time to do. But you're, off, you're, you're better off just going to that place or a place where people use that language uh, to actually learn it than learning it through Rosetta Stone or something like that. Not that that doesn't work, but you know, uh, it's not as effective as just doing the language. Okay, so you, you kind of grow it, uh, and you, uh, you do go through these stages, and we did mention too early in the year that uh, you do have specific regions that deal with the comprehending of language and the expressing of it in your Broca and Vernica areas, and those were discovered, of course, by the, the people with the last names that these regions are uh, uh, named for. Uh, and we know this because, again, if you damage them, if there's a lesion or whatever, you can't uh, either take in language or express it anymore. Uh, so that's what, uh, that's what we know about it as far as circuitry goes. And Chomsky's ideas are widely accepted as, as how language works. Oh, I should also mention, too, and this is really sad, if you get beyond the age of seven and you haven't learned any language at all, um, it's almost like a critical period where if you don't learn it by then, your body won't learn how to incorporate language. So, like, there are some feral children, ones that were raised uh, on their own or in the wild and didn't learn language, or very, very unfortunately, children that were like kept as prisoners uh, and or tortured. That happens, by the way. Really rare, but there's a few instances of where like, you know, a, there was, I'm not gonna get specific, but there's been a couple instances where like a nine-year-old boy and a 13-year-old se separate instances were like kept in their house by their parents and or step-parents and like treated very, very badly and not 
didn't get to learn language. And even when they were uh, discovered and their parents and step-parents went to jail and all that, um, they could learn words, but they could never understand grammar. They couldn't express themselves. So they could like make the sounds almost like a, a, a parrot. Um, and I'm not saying, by the way, they're parrots, but uh, they could like hear and repeat words, but they could never put them together in comprehensive sentences. That's another thing, by the way, uh, Chomsky and Pinker and others uh, discovered was there's a, the words we use are arbitrary, like uh, random, like they can mean anything. The word the, like what the hell is that? It could be la or l or d or das or whatever, like is another language, it doesn't matter what it is. But we all understand what it represents uh, in whatever language. So we have this, along with this uh, inherent intrinsic circuitry, uh, we have like an inherent grammatical structure that we all understand. In all languages except for just a few, um, like over 95% of them have one of two structures. Either you put the subject first and the predicate after, or you put the predicate first and the subject at the end. Um, English and Japan, or English and Japanese are reversed, but nonetheless, almost all languages in the world, you've used the structure that we use in English or, or in Japanese, as far as like uh, how the order is reversed. Like for example, in German, I would say, if I said in English, like if I say, uh, I, uh, this is actually hard to do. Okay, hold on. So if I said, I like to go to the park, all right? In German, I'll use the English words, obviously. You would actually say, I like park. the park to go. That's what you would say instead. So you're actually flipping the order slightly as far as where they're positioned. But nonetheless, if you, uh, if you grow up listening to that, and I can tell you this because that sounded weird to me at first, when I started learning German and how they order it differently, how things, uh, some verbs are, are going at the ends of the, of the beginning, um, it is weird at first, but you get used to it pretty quickly, and, and then you understand it intrinsically. But then it becomes hard to flip it and like say the English version of it, because you actually have to reverse it in your head, and then say it in English. I, I never understood that before I learned it too, because I was always like, "Hey, what did that say to like my Spanish speaker friend or whatever?" And they'd be like, "Uh," and they'd like really think about it, and I was like, "Why is it hard? You know both languages." It's like, "Oh, now I get it," because like. Sometimes the orders are different and they have slightly different meanings or they're like an idiom or a phrase that you'd have to like translate to English and you know, things like that. Because if you said kick the bucket, man, he kicked the bucket, or that guy kicked the bucket and you translated that to German, would you actually just say he kicked the bucket? No, it'd be meaningless. You'd be like, why would he kick a bucket? And you'd be like, no, it actually means he died, right? Uh, so it's like, how do you translate that? Like, you'd probably say, oh, he kicked the bucket, which in, in English for some reason means he died. All right, <clears throat> so anyways. Um, there's a, a, a universal grammar structure, and we all know this intrinsically. Uh, and it can be reversed, but uh, it, it's again, pretty much just one of the two ways. And this is across all languages. Again, the words uh, themselves do vary, and the letters and the symbols vary when the written languages, but nonetheless, they all share this common uh, grammar form. Uh, and we can all comprehend it as long as we learn those individual uh, words and sounds. Uh, and that's a, uh, another piece of evidence for this uh, intrinsic uh, growing language feature. Okay, um, I think that's enough regarding that. Uh, oh, and then we all intrinsically understand the grammar structure. That's basically just syntax, like uh, how you structure your sentences and speak. Because uh, again, again, I can say, uh, I went to the store last Friday, but if I say, I Friday store the two when last, that, that's really hard to comprehend. It's, it's not comprehensible. You could look at it and you don't have to think about it, but if I say I went to the store last Friday, you instantly know what I said. But if I say it, I don't even remember how I just said it, but if I say it in that order, you have to really pick apart uh, what's being said. It's difficult to do that. So we have these natural grammar structures that all um, uh, languages, regardless of the words they choose and the sounds, follow that, that same structure, which means we have the circuitry that expresses and comprehends that way. All right, that's the syntax, the word order, the sentencing. Uh, and we also have a predisposition to learn uh, phonemes and morphemes. Morphemes, not morphemes, it's an opiate. Uh, morphemes and phonemes. Uh, these are kind of like individual letters, and this is the individual, smallest individual units of sound that are made. Kind of like syllables, if that, if that helps. They're similar to, to syllable. All right, so uh, we all understand these intrinsically. Uh, and they are arbitrary, the actual sounds and words, but nonetheless, the structure and way that we arrange them is the same universally. And we do it automatically. Uh, we just grow our language ability because it comes already with us, the software. All right. Um, so that's language. What else is that? Just the stages, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, and then the cultural thing? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Stages are easy. You've got from uh, four to, or is it six? Four. Okay, four, four to 12 months, basically. I know that that, that month might vary in the notes, but I've heard different ranges. Basically from four months till about their first year, depending on the individual uh, child. I think 10 is probably a more common number though. Is the 10, maybe it's 12, but regardless. We'll just say 12, just, just to be safe. Four to 12 months uh, is the babbling stage where they're not actually saying anything, they're just trying to make the sounds. And they actually go through all the different ways you can say things. Like they do the, like the goo goo gaga, -ga, that's real. They actually go through that at some point. They don't, may not necessarily in that order and together, but he or she will make a goo sound at some point and they will make a ga sound and a ma sound and a pa sound and a ta sound. And all these little sounds, they're just trying to figure out how to, how to say them. And then when they start stringing them together, uh, and attaching that string, uh, specific string to a specific object or situation, that's when they're gripping the actual language. So this is the babbling stage, and it can vary. So some kids start it later or end it later than others or earlier than others. Um, but uh, from years roughly one to two, and of course some kids can hit this earlier, uh, they start using, uh, they generally use either one word or as they get closer to two, potentially two word um, statements. Um, and even at that point, even when they start using the two words, maybe even the three, it's what's called telegraphic language. So they're only using the bare minimum to get their point across. So I wouldn't say, hey mom, I'm hungry. I would just go, I'm hung or, I hungry, or mom, I hungry, like that sort of stuff, right? They're cutting out all the unnecessary uh, letters and or sorry, not letters, words, and they're just getting the point across, like uh, uh, me sad or, or I sad, things like that, like the old caveman speaker that you make fun of, like uh, that's telegraphic language, it's just the meaning conveying the uh, minimum amount of the minimum amount of words can make the meaning telegraph. Um, and again, like I said earlier, by about a range, by about age seven, uh, if you haven't learned language, you uh, won't learn how to learn it. Learn how to use it better. And not develop language. If they have it by that point. So like uh, my brother had a really unfortunate situation where he deals with like uh, kids on the autism spectrum and some other things too. And these parents were just, I don't know what they were doing. They were so late on getting their kid help. Uh, he's like seven or eight and he can't speak basically. And they didn't like reach out and find help early. Maybe it couldn't have been help. I mean, maybe there's some damage, you know, somewhere in here. It's not possible anyway. But it's like, and he knew. And then he told me about. It, I was like, oh yeah, uh, that kid's not gonna talk. They were way late on that one. Um, They're like hoping he will talk and all that stuff. And she's like trying to make him do math and reading. And so I was like, dude, you came. He came. Say, mom, like, get over it. Like, fo focus on problems he can make progressions in. Don't try to like jump him into his grade level math yet. He can't even speak. Uh, but anyways. Uh, so yeah, if you get into that situation, or, or and it's really rare, obviously, but uh, after seven, they probably can't learn to use language properly. All right, and that is sad. Uh, but culture does impact language to a degree. So almost all this is just biologically ingrained into our circuitry. Um, but what is arbitrary, like I said, is the, the random sounds and symbols and words we use, and that, that is language. And those languages tend to reflect uh, the values of that culture. So the example you give in the book, and again, this is uh, this is definitely minimal when you talk about language, uh, but it is present. Uh, there is a cultural influence on language. So for example, in uh, the West here, we'll just say West, versus the East, which is like East Asia. I think the, the example is what, Japan and, and English in the United States, right? Japanese and then English. Uh, in the West, we are more focused on individualism, so we have way more words to describe an array of individual emotions, like anger, frustration, greed, jealousy, happiness, contentedness, uh, the list goes on. We have a whole bunch of words to describe that. Most languages outside of the West don't have that many words for individual uh, emotions. So we have uh, more individual focused words, like emotions. Uh, in the East, where uh, cultures are generally more collective, it's more about your town, your village, your society, your family, especially, uh, not so much the individual. Uh, what do you think their vocabulary reflects? Individual emotions? No, because those aren't valued as much. What is valued? 
Yeah, your community, your family, right? So most, uh, they have more words that um, focus on interpersonal um, uh, expressions. So things about uh, the group or between people uh, are more popular. So more interpersonal. Like cohesion and communication and cooperation and things like that. Those are obviously English words, but they have more words that reflect that tone and meaning, or at least proportionally, they're more than the individual ones. So more interpersonal uh, words. And a weird phenomenon they found is you're more likely to identify with a culture's values if you are using that culture's language. And so they took some Canadian, some Chinese Canadian students, and they had them uh, describe or rate uh, their um, how significantly they viewed uh, Chinese values in Chinese and English values or Western values in English. And they, for whatever reason, uh, sc scored higher consistently for supporting whichever values they were in the language they were. So for example, if I gave the same values in Chinese and English, they would side more with the values when they used English than when they used Chinese. And they would side more with the Eastern values when they were uh, communicating in Chinese than when they communicated in English. So they think that has some weird association uh, with people as well regarding uh, culture. Uh, these aren't nearly as important though, the cultural stuff as how the language actually works. So how we take it in, how we all have common structures, even though the actual sounds and words are arbitrary themselves, and how uh, we have a specific and uh, consistent developmental path uh, as, as humans. Assuming that, of course, we don't have some sort of lesion or a genetic uh, deformity that, that inhibits that. Right? Most kids uh, develop this way. Some faster than others, but that's the basic path of development that they have. Any questions about that? Sweet, we have very little time left. <laughs>